If you have your Bibles today, <clears throat> I'm starting a new series called Altars and Idols. Um, and um, I'm going to be in Genesis chapter 6, uh, Senate, uh, 6 and 7 this morning. Um, altars and idols are important parts of Old Testament history. Now, granted, they're not used, you know, today or, you know, like they were back in the, the Old Testament, but there's a lot that we can learn, you know, from that, that, that we can apply to our life today. It's a great, you know, example to us, uh, and we can see things out of altars and idols. Now, I'm going to start, my focus is going to be on altars and kind of as we work through the series, I'll get to idols. So, Old Testament altars... We're very simple in construction, and we have some images that we're going to uh, show you uh, of, of just some, you know, in history or some replicas as well. Sometimes they were basically large existing rocks that were used for religious expression, or they were mid size or kind of larger rocks put together with broken pieces of pottery, just constructed uh, as an altar. They were just done. Sometimes they were kind of random. Sometimes, you know, they were kind of built, you know, and kind of, you know, kind of the, the rocks kind of chiseled where they fit together, but they were used all throughout the Old Testament for different reasons. So, you know, altars appeared throughout the Bible for many different reasons, and I'm going to kind of work through this series. We're going to look at some of these altars in the Old Testament, kind of what it, what it means to us today. So altars are places where we meet God. We see that through the Old Testament, it represented a physical place where someone had an experience with God or met with God or experienced his presence. It was a physical sign of worship or prayer or crying out to God. Now, most churches have an area, you know, kind of designated like we call this the altar area. If you're new to the church, you would just you'd be like, man, that's just steps. What are you what are you talking about? But we understand what that is. Most churches have a place, you know, kind of at the front that people can come. And even though it's not a constructed altar like the Old Testament, they can still kind of have this have this place where they where they can meet uh, where they can meet with God. And I want to say to the altar at Generations Church is still open today. People are still having experience with God, and we keep our altars open. We encourage people, especially at the end, to come and pray, worship, meet with God any way that they want. And I want to say, too, the altar's always open, 24-7, but after midnight, call Bo if you want the altar experience. You know, well, he's had a baby called Brad. He's right, he's right here. But I just want to say the altar's always open. We're always open for people to come and have a moment with the Lord because we are people who believe you can still experience God's presence and power today. We do not believe all of the acts of God's power, you know, ha have been relegated to biblical history. We believe that today you can still have a powerful experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are people of the experience. Altars are places uh, where people meet with God. Altars are places where we remember what God has done for us. And we'll talk about this a little later. Kelsey mentioned it this morning. Psalms 77 says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your miracles of long ago. So when an altar was constructed, it served as a memorial when people came by a week later, a month later, a year later. There was always a story to tell about that particular altar. Altars are a place where sacrifices are offered, especially in the Old Testament, as signs of worship or, or obedience. Uh, Paul 
calls us today to be a living sacrifice. He uses that image uh, in his writing. We'll talk about that. Altars are a place where forgiveness is granted. So there, there are places, you know, uh, in your life that you come and you just need God's forgiveness. And we'll look at times in the altar or the Old Testament where the altars were, were for forgiveness. Altars are places where we go in crisis. Anybody ever had a crisis? Anybody had a moment that you're just like, man, I need, I need God. We're going to look at a time that an altar was built in a moment of crisis. And an altar is also a place of worship. So that's the most common use of an altar uh, in the Old Testament is worship. And there were multiple uses there, but we're going to talk about the altar as a place of worship. So I want to I want to start this morning uh, talking about Noah. Now, Noah is basically known for building one thing. What is that? You got it. But actually, he built an altar as well. He built the ark. And I want to tell you the story of of the uh, the, uh, altar that Noah built, but you have to kind of unpack his story just a little bit to kind of understand what brought him to this moment of experience in, in building the altar. So uh, I'm going to read out of Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. I'm going to go through some of Genesis 6 and 7. We're going to look at Noah, the altar of grace, and the altar of gratitude. So um, Genesis 6, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only on evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I've created. Along with the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. Oh, excuse me. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. He walked faithfully with God. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and it was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people of the earth had corrupted their ways. God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. The earth is filled with violence. Because of them, I'm going to destroy them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it. Coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Make a roof for it. Uh, leaving, leaving below the roof, uh, the roof and opening one cubit high all around. Put a door on the side of the ark. Make lower and middle and upper decks. Boom. 60 words. I mean, he says a lot. That last, that last part. Hey, I want you to build an ark. I want you to, you know, coat it inside and out. 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, three decks. I mean, that's, that's a lot. It's kind of like my wife's to-do note, you know, uh, spouse notes. Hey, uh, would you paint the house this afternoon and sod the yard? I mean, in 60 words, that's a lot. That is, that's a lot. But it says Noah did everything just as God commanded. So he starts to build the ark. He doesn't go down to the architecture office and pick up plans He's like, this is from the very beginning. I mean, he's, he's doing this all, okay? There's no, you know, like, hey, can you get a drop ship from Home Depot? We need some lumber here. It's not, it's not there. He realizes he's the general contractor, and he's the subcontractor as well. Tools, you know, that he used at that time, maybe they were efficient, you know, for that, for that particular time, you know, just like the planning, all of this rest on, rest on Noah. But it's not uncommon 
to, to the Lord. When the Lord, when you get a commission and a charge and direction from the Lord, He gives you that. But then you have to figure out the rest, okay? God, we're always working with God, you know, to accomplish His will. He puts things in our hands. Here's what I want you to do, but He leaves it to us with creativity, innovation, work ethic, work speed. I mean, you can do great things for God, but you can also fail as well because God places that in our hands. So he starts to build the boat. <clears throat> now he's not building this close to water. He's building this enormous boat just on a flat piece of land. And it's large. And I imagine over a period of time, some of the local people come to him and go, what are you doing? Well, what, what is going on? Like, what are you building? This is this is huge. They had to be curious about this very large construction. And I'll just make the assumption it would be the largest construction probably that they've ever seen if they had their own little, little houses. This is large. Why, what are you doing? Why, why, are, why are you building this? And, and Noah had the opportunity to explain what was what was going on and why he was building it and what, what God had spoken to him. So some, they probably listened out of curiosity. Some might have made fun of him because, you know, it says that they were all about evil, you know, in, that, in the world at that particular time. So how long was the construction of the ark? How long did this take? All right. Based on the age of Noah, and you can read before and after, Noah and his sons, they think it's somewhere 30 years or more. 30 years or more. That's a long time to do construction. Okay, that's a long, that's a long time. And he's doing it all. He's the general and he's the sub. Verse 7, the Lord said to Noah, go into your ark you and your whole family, because I've found you righteous in this generation. <clears throat> Take with you pairs of every kind of clean animal, one pair of every kind of unclean animal. Seven days from now, I'm going to send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm going to wipe from the face of the earth every living creature, all right? I mean, are there times you hear from the Lord and you respectfully go, Lord, I will do it. But in the back of your mind, you go, that is the craziest thing I have ever heard in my life. Like, I'm sure Noah's going, how am I going to round up these animals? You can't, I, can't even, I can't even get the chickens in the morning, you know, much less, you know, fill this, fill this ark as, you know, as well. You know, so, like, so he says you got one week. Here are the animals that need to be on here. But verse 5 out of, out of chapter 7 says, Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. He did all that the Lord commanded. May not have understood everything, may not have agreed with everything or comprehended the whys. You know, sometimes God doesn't always tell me why. Okay? Sometimes he just says, do it. Just walk in obedience. Noah did all that the Lord commanded him, so the boat is finished. Now, are there any of you that have been to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky? Would you raise your hand? So you've kind of seen the, you know, if there's anything that that does, it gives you kind of the scope of that. We have some images of, of that as well, just so that you can kind of see the size. Listen, that's a lot of trees chopping down, I want to tell you. I mean, that's a big 450 feet long, 75 feet high, 45 feet wide, three levels, a door on the side, and a, a window at the top, okay? Just so that you can get the scale of that, Noah, Noah did that. So they're going, it's 30, 35 years or more that it took to construct that. Verse 6 <clears throat> says, Noah was 600 years old when he completed this. Listen, 
Amen. Don't you ever complain about how old you are. My bones creak, pop, I got to have ibuprofen. This guy's he's doing construction at 600. All right? When the floodwaters came on the earth, Noah and his sons and his wives, sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, birds and all the creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark. Just all of a sudden, unbelievably, they just start coming. Have you ever seen that in the little kid's book, Illustrated? Literally, that's the way that it happened. Noah's not out with a rope trying to wrangle them all up. God, just in his plan, just started bringing them. It said they came to Noah, and they entered, they entered the ark, as God commanded to Noah. After seven days... Floodwaters came on the earth. Now, it's always a question when we talk about the animals on the ark. <clears throat> Why did Noah let some animals on and keep some animals off? All right? Like, why did he let cats on board? Okay? We don't need them. We don't need them. Okay? But he let them in for whatever reason. Okay? Or why did he allow gators on board? Do we need gators? I thought I'd throw you that softball this morning. I, I thought I'd get that. Animals are on board. And then it said, the Lord shut him in. The final part of this construction was not with Noah. The final part of this was from God. He builds the boat, <clears throat> gathers his family. The animals are in. God shuts and completes the construction. And I'm sure this starts a very fearful and uncertain time for Noah and his family. They are in the boat, but, but they know that the judgment of God is about to come upon the earth, and they really don't even probably understand what is about to happen. They know God's judgment for all mankind is coming on the earth because of the wickedness and the violence of all mankind. So I'm, I'm sure this was a fearful and uncertain time. This is not a game. And I'm sure when God finished the final construction on that, on that window or that door, man, there was probably some anxiety when that, when that door was shut. Verse 17, it says, For 40 days the flood kept coming. On the earth. <clears throat> and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth. And the ark floated on the surface of the water. What a dark, scary moment. Rain begins to fall. And it falls very heavily. At night, because of the clouds, there's no... There's no moon. There's no stars. It's a non-stop soaking rain that just begins to hit with those people on the inside. Now, let me say, too, they're not even sure at this moment in history that there had ever been rain like we know it. Maybe it had, but some people go it's never really mentioned before. So that would even add... To more anxiety, man, if you've never even seen or experienced rain, this driving torrential rain this, that doesn't stop. And I mean, it's 40 days and, and 40 nights. And probably a few days in to this torrential downpour, they might have heard voices on the outside. People that maybe had made fun of this ark, and had been skeptical of what Noah was doing. And when Noah explained God's going to judge the earth because of wickedness, they might have laughed or scorned or thought that is, that is crazy. They might have heard knocks. Hey, Noah! Noah! Hey! Listen, you got any, you got any space? Noah! Hey! Hey! We lived not too far from you. Any way that we can 
get in, but the rain continues to come. And then they, they feel the boat start to kind of rock back and forth as the water is getting close to lifting this, and they start to feel this thing go back and forth, and then, man, it lifts. That passage says that it, that it lifts. Now, for some of you, you only have one point of reference of this, so let me remind you that this ark is not the Royal Caribbean Explorer of the Seas, okay? There's no stabilizer. There's no rudder. There's no propulsion at all. When it started floating, it was all over the place. It was moving, you know, all, all the time. There's no dinner in the sapphire room at night. There's no buffet in the wind jammer in the afternoon. There's no fancy animal towels on your bed at night next to your mints. This is a completely different experience, okay? Seasick animals, probably seasick people. This probably had to have been one of the, the worst experiences that they've ever had. They don't know what's going on. They don't understand. One thing they do notice is they probably don't hear any voices anymore. They probably don't hear any more knocks on the side as the boat, as the boat lifted. No lights at night. No one to come to their aid <clears throat> or rescue. Probably one of the most horrible, scary things they had ever been through in their life. Forty days. Forty days it did not stop raining. And then it says, once the rain stopped, that it took 150 days for the water to kind of, to kind of recede from the earth. Now, let, let me say this. The story of Noah doesn't exist just by itself, just because it's kind of an interesting story, but there are things about this story that God wants us to see and that are very familiar to us that live today and those in the time of Jesus. And I want you to see, before I go on to the story, I want you to see some of these similarities as well. Similarities in the times of Noah and Jesus. Both tell of present wickedness. Both mention wickedness at that particular time, in the time of Jesus, and in the time that we live. So why does this all happen? Because God is grieved at the wickedness and violence that what, what, is, what was happening at that period of time. That passage that we read said, those people were, man, they had wickedness on their mind all the time. All right, Jesus said this when he was talking about his return. He refers back to the time of Noah when he's and he says, "As was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man." For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up until the day that Noah entered the ark. So he said, "Man." They weren't moved even when the ark was in its final, you know, in its final construction phase. They weren't moved at all. But he says, for, for you and I, this is what the world is going to be like before I return. Very similar. Very similar. We have the message of judgment. We have the message of, you know, uh, of, of, of God being upset with our wickedness. But it doesn't move our society doesn't move the United States. If anything, we double down on our wickedness. We double down on our iniquity. We are not bending our knee or looking, or looking to, to get our hearts right with God. So both stories tell of present wickedness. Both tell, in both stories, there are warnings about sin and evil. His anger. He's upset. God is upset. 
at our disobedience. God is upset then. God is upset now. His anger is against sin and iniquity and brokenness and immorality and sexual abuse and slavery and abortion, the abuse of children. The same God that has anger in the time of Noah looks today. And if you think that he thinks any different, you would be wrong. He gets angry at iniquity. I was driving down the road here in Tallahassee a while back. And I was I slowed down because it was kind of a one-way one way road. And there was a man and a woman and they were walking on the side of the road. And when I, when I drove past, the man reached back and slapped the woman as hard as he could slap her. And I, I mean, I was stunned. I didn't know what to think. I drove up, you know, about 20 feet, and I'm looking in my rearview mirror, and she's doubled over in pain, and I'm just shocked at what I saw. And then I just got, I got very angry. I got very angry. I put my car in reverse. I pulled back. I got out of the car and I said, hey, do not touch her again. And I had my phone, and I said, ma'am, can I help you? Do you want to get in my car? Do you want me to take you somewhere? He said something. I said, do not say anything again. I don't know what I was thinking at that point. So sometimes when you get upset, you just go way overboard. I was writing checks with my mouth that I could not cash. I promise you that. <laughs> And she said, no, she was crying. I said, ma'am, I'll call the police right now. I'll take you, I'll take you in my van. She said, no, it would, it would make it worse. Please, please go, all right? Now, I have no emotional connection. I don't know these people at all. But yet at the violence, I was furious. If you think God looks at what goes on in the world and he's just whistling, you're wrong, the same God that was angry with, with the iniquity and sin of the society in the time of Moses still looks at us that same way. The ark in that time was the continual warning of God's judgment. Peter calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. He was not just a construction foreman, but in that moment he was telling people to return and repent. And I want you to know, in the midst of all the iniquity this morning, God warns us. We, procl- we, we, we tell others about God's impending judgment upon the earth, but he does provide a way of salvation through the cross of Jesus Christ. Romans 2 says this, Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they've done. So I want to remind you, He does not look away at sin and iniquity. He's watching over us. And there's a day of judgment and justice to come. Something else that's similar. Escape from God's punishment is offered. In the time of Noah, it was the ark. In the time of Jesus today, it is the cross and it is is grace. It is grace. So, we don't have to walk into God's judgment. We don't have to stand before the Lord being fearful about what we hear, about what's, what's happening in my heart. Romans 3 says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every person. There's no exemption. We've failed God. We've all sinned. We've broken His heart. We've we've done things that we know that we should not do. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then it says, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. So he says, yes, there's judgment to come. But you don't have to face that judgment. There's a way out. And that is through the cross of Jesus and the grace of Jesus. The last similarity is that there is a time that the day of grace ends and judgment begins. There's a time that it's over, all right? That you've had every opportunity, every every opportunity to respond to God's grace because we 
especially in this country, we live as though there is no judgment from God that has come. We live our own lives, our own way. We judge our own selves by our own standard of righteousness. But I want you to know that there is a day that the day of grace and the day of mercy ends and that you had your last opportunity. Those folks in Noah's time lived in the shadow of the ark and they played roulette with their life and they lost out. And I want to say to you today that the day of grace does not extend forever. We do not know when our Lord may return. We do not know when our our hearts and our bodies cease and we stand before God. And I want to implore you in this day of grace and mercy that we live, bow your knee, come to God, open your heart up to Jesus Christ. Let Him forgive your sin. Let Him do a powerful work in your life. We just keep living, living, I will. But I'm just telling you, we're in, a, we're in a supernatural, spiritual battle here, and you better pay attention. Jesus referred to people living in the shadow of an almost completed ark who did not change their life and behavior. And I'm just telling you, we're on the brink of the return of the Lord Jesus. I believe that. Or we could be close to breathing our last breath. Whatever way it is, man, get your heart right with God. Get your heart right with God. The boat comes to rest on the ground. Noah comes out of the ark. First time his feet are on the ground. The order and the beauty that he's known in the earth is gone. Leaves are off trees, leaves are off the bushes, probably some trees pushed over. He's looking at this. Mud, silt, sediment everywhere. The rotting, you know, fish, sea life that had been in the sea everywhere. Decaying bodies of the animals that roam the earth everywhere. And probably worse than that, seeing human bodies here and there as well. He sees this carnage. He sees this scene. And he looks back at the ark. The ark that saved him. And he realized that the ark was God's provision for him. It was God's salvation for him. And he sees his family coming out of the ark as well. They've been saved as well. He's seeing this horrible scene, but he's looking back on this ark. And the scripture says he does something very unusual. It's probably an emotional moment for him, but he does something that is unusual and is unprecedented in Scripture. He starts to take rocks and he starts to build an altar. Nobody told him to. Nobody, no, God didn't tell him to, but he's moved in this moment and he starts to put, he starts to put an an altar. It says Noah built an altar to the Lord and he starts to, you know, he starts to construct this altar. Okay. What, again, there was no Old Testament precedent. You need to build altars. There was nothing ever written. This is the first altar ever built, you know, in the, in the Old Testament. But he's looking at the scene. He's seeing the ark and he's seeing the the carnage of what is in front of him. And I want to just say to you that I don't think you can really appreciate God's love and grace until you understand God's imminent judgment on our life. When you look at the scene that Noah saw, then it's not a surprise that he built an altar. Grace is an act of God's love and mercy toward us. We all deserve judgment. In this society, they use the word karma. 
grace, you know, you get what karma is. You get what you deserve. But grace is the opposite of karma because with grace, you get what you don't deserve at all. You get God's love. The book of Psalms says He does not treat us as our sins deserve. And sometimes, man, you can't really appreciate God's grace, man, until you understand kind of, kind of what, you know, the, the imminent judgment that we walk in. Sometimes we sing the song of amazing grace, but it's not amazing to us anymore. It's just plain old grace because we don't really uh, comprehend how amazing that it is that God loves us, that God's chosen us, that God's provided a pathway for you and I to escape judgment through the cross of Jesus Christ. Good news is just news until you hear the bad news. Then it becomes good news. Then it's good news. Grace forgives your past. Isn't that great? Bad choices, stupid mistakes. How many of you have done dumb things that you knew better? Yeah, we'll have a small group for that at some point. All right? But I want to tell you something this morning, you know. Like, some, sometimes people feel like my sin is horrible, my sin is terrible, and, and it is. But I want you to know, it does not matter what you have done in your past, what sin that you have committed. There is love, grace, and forgiveness for your life if you will reach out for Jesus. There is a principle in the Bible that said, when sin is bad and increasing, then grace increases all the more. So if you think that you've been terrible and awful, then I want you to know there is more grace that can forgive you and that can transform your life. Sin is bad, but grace is greater. All things in your life that are bad, that's fine. Grace is sufficient and meets all the needs there. Grace forgives our sins and the psalmist says he throws our sins as far as the east is from the west. Never to be remembered ever again. And if you're very young, I'll give you a modern day, a modern day example. Your, your sins like are on a computer, they are deleted, they are put in the trash file and that trash file is empty. Never more to be remembered against you again. That's grace. That's grace. Grace cleanses your heart. Grace cleanses. Sometimes we live in shame. We live in shame by what we've done. Hey, He just doesn't take our sin. He takes our shame as well. You don't have to be embarrassed anymore. You don't have to hold your head down when grace forgives. Man, you're just like one of the family. You can worship just like everyone else. Your conscience can be clear just like everyone else when you have been forgiven. Grace humbles and makes me thankful. Grace humbles and makes me thankful. Noah looks at this scene. And then he looks back at the ark. And he's moved. He's moved. He starts to build, he starts to build an altar. He is humbled when he realized, man, this is my, my, my family over here. I was, I was chosen. He's moved and he's thankful for God's provision, all right? A train of Jewish prisoners in April of 1945 on the way to a concentration camp, they are certain to, to die. It's at the end of the war. We have an image here. But on the way, on the way to the, uh, on the, way to the concentration camp there, man, there was the train stopped. Do we have that image we don't have the image. I have it on my iPad. I'll hold it up for you. What it shows is when that train stopped and those people who thought they had imminent death, they, were, they came off the train because of the allies. There were smiles. There was joy. There was tears. Because grace will humble you. Grace will make you... Grace will make you thankful. Brent, worship team, you guys can come. Noah built this altar. Noah built this altar, all right? All right. 
And God was moved at the sight. God was moved at what he saw. Now, let me say, God is moved with our iniquity and our sin, but God is also moved at our obedience and our humility when we reached out, when we reach out to him. So when, when God saw Noah build this altar and he offered this sacrifice, you know, he offered this sacrifice, the Lord said, I'll never do this ever again. I'll never do this again. And Noah, I'm going to bless your life. I'm going to bless, I'm going to bless your descendants. God is moved at our iniquities, but he's also moved at our grace. He's moved at our worship. He's moved, he's moved at our obedience as well. So Noah didn't just build the first altar <clears throat> on his own casually. This was a, the end of an experience that he had where, man, he understood God's grace. Man, I was, I was headed just like everyone else, but God saved me. And I want to say the same for you. There is provision for you today through the person of Jesus Christ. We all stand before God at some point. We all, we all make an account. All stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Me, you, everyone. Okay? But he provides a way through the person of Jesus. All right? But I want to tell you, when you realize that, when you realize that, like, I'm not just trying to get you out of judgment. I want you to walk into the best decision you'll ever make in your life, and that is to follow Jesus, okay? I'm not just trying to get you out of the bad. I'm just telling you, there's joy. There is joy serving Jesus, knowing Jesus, being saved, having assurance in my heart, you know, that I'm, I'm ready to meet the Lord. There's, there's joy there. And we're going to do baptism in just a minute. They're going to bring the kiddos over. We're going to baptize people here, but I want to I just want to give you that, that opportunity. Like, what, what can you learn out of, out of Noah's story today? Man, that everybody, man, God does not wink at iniquity in anyone's life, even the life of his own son, okay? And that we all have a destiny that we stand before God. And what are you going to do with that moment? What will you do? What will you do with that moment? I phrase it, I, I phrase it this way. That if you do three things, then God will do three things. If you admit that you need God in your life, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and if you'll confess your sins, if you'll do those three things, if you'll do those three things, all right, admit, believe, and confess, then God's going to do three things for you. He's going to forgive your sins. He's going to forgive your sins. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter how bad. He's going to forgive your sins. He's going to give you a new life. Okay? He turns the page. You write a new story. You know, your, your future is not tied to your past. There is forgiveness and grace. There is a new chapter. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He writes a new story when you give him that opportunity. And he gives us eternal life. Well, see, we're going to live eternally forever somewhere. I just choose to live with the Lord. And he's going to give eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe on him should never perish but have everlasting life. That's his promise for you this morning. I'm going to pray. Maybe you're here today for whatever reason. You're away from God. <clears throat> you got some issues in your life. Maybe God's kind of been dealing with you and you find yourself in a church. Maybe somebody invited you this morning. I want to say today's your day. Today, you're living in a day of grace. You get an opportunity to hear and respond. I want you to, I want you to take advantage of it. I want you to take advantage of it. They're going to put a prayer up on the screen. And I'm going to just kind of pray that prayer. And if you just look at it and you can mumble it, you can just nod in affirmation. But I want you this morning to give the Lord the opportunity to save you this morning and have a transformed life today. So, Father, I know that I've broken your laws and my sins have separated me from you. I'm truly sorry. 
and I want to turn from my sinful past toward you. Please forgive me. I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, died for my sins and was resurrected from the dead and is alive and he hears my prayer. I invite Jesus to become the Lord of my life, to rule and reign in my heart from this day forward. In Jesus' name, I pray. That's it. That's it. That's how simple. That's just how it's not complicated. It's not complicated. That's how simple it is. Would you stand? Would you stand? Worship team, would you just lead us in a moment? I'm going to give you more instructions in just a second. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above. Come on, sing again in this place, Jesus. Your name is the highest. recipient of God's grace. My last point was that grace humbles you and grace makes you thankful. Where would you have been? What would have happened in your life if it had to been for God's grace and the cross? Across the building in your own way, would you just give him thanks? Would you just take a moment and thank him? <clears throat> would you just take a moment and thank him? Just just a moment of just verbal expression today across the building would you just do that would you just thank him would you just thank him this morning 
across the building would you just thank him this morning would you just thank him lord we're humbled lord where would we have been without you lord we're humbled we're thankful lord for your grace we don't take it for granted this morning we're so thankful for your grace so thankful for you this morning lord so thankful for the cross of jesus salvation lord you've changed our lives you've forgiven our sins lord we thank you for that today we thank you for that today one more time give the lord a shout of praise lord we love you lord we love you lord we love you lord i want to say too that man if you have given your heart to the lord maybe you've prayed that prayer you're a prodigal that's come back after service i want you to see me i want you to see some of our team we want to maybe talk to you about that we want to talk to you about that moment we celebrate with you this morning all right are you ready for baptisms this morning lead us in some baptism music this morning we're going we're going to celebrate new lives today we're going to celebrate oh he picked me up he turned me around he placed my feet on solid ground i think the master I thank the Savior because he healed my heart. He changed my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. Yeah. Sing, I thank God. Come on, can we sing it one more time? Come on, he picked me up. Sing it out. He picked me Turn me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because he healed my heart, yeah. Changed my name forever free. I'm not the same, I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God. Amen, amen. Well, hey, we are celebrating today. You can have a seat. We are celebrating today because we are baptizing six of our GC kids. And so I want to call Caroline Bozeman to come up first. Caroline first uh, started following Jesus back in 4K, and as she's grown, she's started to love Jesus more and more and develop her relationship with him and I love in her baptism workbook uh, she said that now that she has a relationship with Jesus she knows that she is not alone that she has Jesus by her side and so Caroline we're so excited to celebrate baptism with you today go ahead and step in there Caroline have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And you promise to serve Jesus all the days of your life? Yes. Caroline, upon your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hey, I'm lost without the world. I am free. Oh, I am free. I am free. Hey, I'm lost without the world. This is my buddy Connor. Connor's been in GC Kids for a long time now, and uh, the Lord is doing some great things in his life. Connor accepted Jesus as a young boy and has just continued to grow in his relationship with Jesus. He said the thing that's different about him now is that he has just ultimate happiness and joy that he is following Jesus in his life. Connor, we're so proud of you and so proud that you're taking this next step in your relationship with Jesus. Connor, have you accepted Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. And do you promise to serve Jesus all the days of your life? Yes. Connor, upon your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
uh, I'm not only proud of what Maggie, uh, God is doing in Maggie's life, but her entire family, uh, her parents, her brother, just an incredible family that's been part of this church for a long time. And uh, Maggie, I'm so proud of you today. Maggie accepted Jesus here at church in GC Kids. And uh, she too is just continuing to grow closer and closer to Jesus. I think this family's here every time the doors are open. And uh, I told them, man, they are our, her, her kids are our star students on Wednesday nights. They are here being discipled, doing the things their teachers uh, are asking them to do. And ultimately that leads to discipleship. That leads to growing in their relationship with God. So Maggie, I'm so proud of you. So honored to be your kids pastor and so happy I get to baptize you today. Maggie, have you accepted Jesus to be the Savior of your life? Yes. And do you promise to serve Jesus all the days of your life? Yes. Maggie, upon your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pick me up and turn me around. Place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. This is a special one for me. This is my niece, Emerson, and uh, I think this is the first family member I've gotten to baptize. So this is an awesome moment, and uh, it's cool when you get to see family follow Jesus. Amen. And uh, Emerson first accepted Jesus when she was four years old, but over the course of the last year, we've just uh, seen her continue to grow in her relationship with Jesus, uh, choosing to follow him uh, every day. Emerson, I'm so, so proud of you. Uh, she wrote in her uh, baptism uh, booklet that uh, she's excited because she has gone from old to new because of Jesus, and we're excited about that. She said she loves coming to church, and uh, she's excited to continue to grow in her relationship and be more like Jesus. So, Emmy, we're going to baptize you today, all right? Emerson, have you made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. And do you promise to serve Jesus all the days of your life? Yes. Emerson, upon your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He picked me up, he turned me around, lays my feet on the solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because he healed my heart. He changed my name, forever free, I'm not the same. So many kids getting baptized, I had to make myself a cheat sheet down here. It's a lot to remember. Come on up here. This is Emma Valise. In a few minutes, we're going to get to baptize her mom as well. And uh, this family has just started coming to our church in the last few months. And just another family that uh, has been so committed and been here every time the doors were open. Uh, Emma is actually one of our new sixth graders, so uh, she's being passed off from GC Kids to GC Youth um, just in the last couple weeks, um, but uh, since she loves Pastor Bo more, she wanted me to baptize her. No, no, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but this girl right here, man, she is so passionate about her relationship with Jesus. She is doing great things, and uh, I just found out something about you today, Emma. This girl right here, a new sixth grader at Raw Middle School, is getting ready to help start a good news club so that she can help tell other students about Jesus at her middle school. So Emma, go ahead. We're so proud of you, so glad that we get to be part of your baptism and you taking your next step in your relationship with Jesus. So Emma, have you made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. And you promise to serve Jesus all the days of your life? Yes. Emma, upon your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He picked me up, he turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because he healed my heart, he changed my name.
buddy Alex Garcia and uh, Alex accepted Jesus as a young boy as well and Jesus just continue to do great things in his life in his baptism workbook he said he's seen Jesus do miracles in his young life he's seen Jesus meet his needs and he wants to follow Jesus with all of his heart Alex go ahead and step in there buddy Alex have you made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life and do you promise to serve Jesus all the days of your life? Awesome. Alex, upon your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. this guy he's been around here for a long time and uh, this is Austin Acre and uh, man I'm just so proud of him like I said he's grown up in this church uh, he's been through uh, kids ministry here and now is in our youth ministry and uh, a couple months ago uh, God did just a work in Austin's life at camp and uh, man the growth that I've seen in him over the last couple of months has just been incredible and God's really working in him and uh, man, I asked him the other day why he wanted to be baptized. And he said, you know, I've kind of been around for a long time. I, I've always known about God, but I've never really lived for God. And he said, just with what God is doing in my heart, he's like, I can't really like get away from it. And I just need everybody to know about it. And man, he's, he's challenged me. He said he's gone to school. He's told all of his friends. He's been so excited about this. So I just want you to know how proud of, of you our church is and how we're rooting and cheering you on. All right, so let's step in there. So Austin, you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Yes. And you, you are gonna live for him all the days of your life. Yes. Austin, because of your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pick me up. You turn me around, place my feet on the solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because he healed my heart. He changed my name, forever free. I'm not the same, I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God. All right. <clears throat> well, Bo and Brad, they got to... Uh baptize the innocent ones i'm baptizing the bad sinners now yeah some bad folks up here bad folks I, hey no i'm just kidding but we all go from old life to new life we go from death to life and that's what baptism is so i want janice rodriguez janice if you would come janice come on up here come on up here we just baptized her daughter Janice has been here for a couple of months, and man, God has done something powerful in her life. She's just had some issues in her past, been struggling with a few things, but she's seen God just man, do a work in her life, and she wants to publicly make a confession of faith. So Janice, before this congregation today, you want to publicly confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And you want everyone to know that the rest of your life, you're going to be a follower of Jesus. Let's baptize you. Janice, because of your profession of faith and your desire to be a follower of Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He picked me up. He turned me around. Place my feet on the solid ground. I thank the master. I thank the savior. Because he healed my heart. He changed my name. Forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the master. I thank the savior. I thank God. Amen. Amen. This is Sheila. Hey, I want to tell you, we got baptism shirts that say, I belong to Jesus. And then when they get wet, they say, and he belongs to me. Amen? Amen. 
So Sheila, um, this morning you want to make your profession of faith for Jesus Christ this morning? Yes. You want everyone to know that the rest of your life you want to be a follower of Jesus. You're going to love and serve him. Yes. Let's baptize you this morning. Because of your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He picked me up, he turned me around, he lays my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior, because he healed my heart, he changed my life. This is Michaela, and she's been here a few months, and uh, God's been doing some work in her life and just in her own testimony. Man, she's gone through some depression and anxiety and some, you know, some uh, uh, addiction issues, but they're all in the past. We're believing they're all in the past, and if you've ever kind of gone through anything like that, maybe you've come out of a period of addiction in your life before you leave today, I want you to encourage her because we're going to pray for her. We're going to believe that what the Lord has started, he's going to be faithful to complete, but also he brings the body of Christ alongside to have a role in that. So, all right. So Michaela, you want everyone to know this morning and you want to confess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Yes, sir. You believe in his death and his resurrection. 100% yes, sir. And you want everyone to know that the rest of your life, you want to be a follower of Jesus. Yes. All right, let's baptize you this morning. <laughs> Michaela, because of your faith in Jesus Christ and your desire to be a follower of his, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He picked me up, he turned me around, but lays my feet on. This is Mia. She's no stranger around here. She's been around here a while. Uh, she's been through a lot of things in the past. She's uh, a cancer survivor, okay? Yeah. And when you walk through things like that, when you come through, you have a different perspective over life. And it's at this moment, this morning, in kind of her life journey that she wants to be baptized. So. Mia, before God in this congregation, you confess Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Yes. You believe in his death and his resurrection. Yes. And this is your public act to let everyone know the rest of your life you're going to be a follower of his. Most definitely. Most definitely. Let's baptize you. Mia, because of your faith in Jesus Christ and your desire to be a follower of His, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. this morning all baptisms are great but family baptisms are just a little bit better so this is Mia's son is Jesus he's a college student here and uh, today before God in this congregation you want to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior yes, sir. believe in his death and his resurrection 100%. just like his mom 100% and you want everyone to know, live stream everyone here, but the rest of your life you want to be a follower of Jesus. Yes, sir. Let's baptize you this morning. I want to say to our college students, I want you to find him before, we, before you leave this morning. 
Jesus, because of your faith in Jesus Christ and your desire to be a follower of His, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. this morning to be part of this family baptism not just the uniqueness of a family baptism but in his own life in his own life there are times you get out of college you're working and man things kind of get lost in focus and you need to come back to faith and that's what he's doing this morning so Jeffrey uh, uh, you want to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior yes and you believe in Jesus death and resurrection yes and before God in this congregation, you want to let everyone know that the rest of your life, you want to serve Him. Yes. Let's baptize you. Amen. On this last baptism, would you stand? This last baptism, would you stand? Jeffrey, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, your desire to be a follower of Him, you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I get so excited during Baptism Sunday, man. I just love seeing what God's doing in people's lives.